Throughout history, scientists have continued to look for smaller and smaller structures. The ancient Greeks began the idea that a solid mass could be broken down into smaller pieces of itself. We then found that those pieces could be broken down into smaller atoms. Eventually, we discovered that the atoms were made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Particle physics seeks to take those pieces and break them into even smaller parts. The Rutherford model of the atom described as it as being positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons. Neutrons were discovered a few decades later and were added to this model. When we think of the nucleus, we often think of it as a large centerpiece and rarely are there any diagrams drawn to scale. If you were to grow an atom to the size of your room, the nucleus would be about the size of a grain of rice. So the atom is made up of mostly empty space. One of the big problems with this model is that all of those positively charged particles are in close proximity. We know that like charges repel each other, so it would stand to reason then that the nucleus of an atom containing all positive and neutral charges should not hold together. The second problem with this model is that we have a negatively charged particle orbiting the nucleus. If an electron is in orbit, it is changing direction, which means it is accelerating. Accelerating charged particles give off radiation. And if radiation is being given off, then the electron must be losing energy, which would cause it to spiral into the nucleus. When it comes down to it, there are only four distinct basic forces in all of nature. Gravity is actually the weakest of the four, but it does keep us here on Earth, and it keeps the Earth revolving around the Sun, and it holds the suns in our respective galaxies. Electromagnetic forces are responsible for the sunlight warming the Earth, chemistry, our computers, our cell phones, lots of things we use every day and never really think about. The weak nuclear force causes the fission of an atom along with its radioactivity, while the strong nuclear force is what holds the nucleus of an atom together. Now one of these things is not like the other. Gravity is kind of out there on its own because it does not depend on any type of charge. However, all four of these forces are similar in that they are all manifestations of attractions between particles. Particle physicists use Feynman diagrams to describe how particles interact with each other at the subatomic level. Feynman diagrams utilize what is known as quantum electrodynamics, or QED, and are used to show how each of the forces can be understood as the exchange of particles. The Feynman diagram is essentially a graph of the position of the electrons plotted against the time. Going up along the y-axis, time increases, and going to the right, the position increases. So say two electrons move towards each other. We know that light charges repel each other because of the electromagnetic forces involved. In quantum electrodynamics, things get a little bit more complicated than simple electric and magnetic fields, so we use the Feynman diagram to represent those interactions. In this diagram, as time increases, the two electrons are getting closer to one another. As the electrons get closer to each other, one of them will begin to release energy in the form of a photon. Particles are still obeying the law of conservation of momentum at this point, so releasing this energy causes the electron to change directions. The photon is absorbed by the second electron, and again, because of the conservation of momentum, the second electron will change its direction as well. So quantum electrodynamics tells us that this electromagnetic force that interacts between electrons is because of a photon of energy. So we can actually consider that the photon itself is the carrier of the electromagnetic force. Now, we cannot actually measure this photon. We cannot see it. Even though it is released by one electron and absorbed by another, we cannot see it. So we refer to it as a virtual photon, and we say that it carries, or mediates, the electromagnetic force that causes the electrons to repel each other. The electrons are repelled by each other, but do not ever actually physically come in contact. If photons can carry an electromagnetic force, then it stands to reason that particles would be able to carry other forces as well. We can draw a Feynman diagram for what happens when two protons approach each other as well. Just like with electrons, when they get too close to each other, one proton releases a burst of energy in the form of a virtual proton. Conservation of momentum sends it recoiling and sends the other proton in another direction as well. In 1935, Hideki Kawa proposed the idea that this particle is exchanged between subatomic particles and transmits the force between them. It was believed at that point that the meson was the particle that mediated the strong nuclear force. This particle is now known as the pion. So whenever a proton interacts with a neutron, a meson, or pion, 
is exchanged. We can use the Feynman diagram and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to determine the mass of this meson. When the proton and neutron approach each other, they get within a certain distance d. d is the range of the strong nuclear force and is known as 1 Fermi, or 1 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. At this point, the proton releases the meson. The meson is then absorbed by the neutron. The proton is rebounded away from the meson as the meson is released, and the neutron recoils in the other direction as the meson is absorbed. To make our calculations a little bit easier, we are going to assume that our proton is initially at rest. Now since the meson is itself energy, in order for the proton to release the meson, it must have to release some energy. If the proton is at rest, it does not have kinetic energy. This is where the uncertainty principle comes in. In this situation, energy does not have to be conserved if the time period involved is very, very small. So the energy from the proton needed to create the meson times the time it takes for the meson to travel to the neutron is equal to Planck's reduced constant. Since the meson is essentially a photon, we can replace the change in energy with mc squared, where m is the mass of the meson and c is the speed of light. We could just leave it as delta e because the mass of a subatomic particle is not measured in kilograms, but in what was known as the rest mass energy, or mc squared. But conventionally, we do write it as mc squared. Now since we know the distance between the proton and the neutron, we can use that divided by the speed of light to find the change in time. Then we can rearrange and solve for the rest mass energy. From here we can plug in the speed of light, Planck's constant, and the distance from the proton to the neutron, and we find that the rest mass energy of a meson is about 100 mega electron volts.